In mathematical physics, equations of motion are equations that describe the behavior of a physical system in terms of its motion as a function of time. More specifically, the equations of motion describe the behavior of a physical system as a set of mathematical functions in terms of dynamic variables. Normally spatial coordinates and time are used, but others are also possible, such as momentum components and time. The most general choice are generalized coordinates which can be any convenient variable characteristic of the physical system. The functions are defined in a Euclidean space in classical mechanics, but are replaced by curved spaces in relativity. If the dynamics of a system is known, the equations are the solutions to the differential equations describing the motion of the dynamics. There are two main descriptions of motion, dynamics and kinematics. Dynamics is general, since momenta, forces and energy of the particles are taken into account. In this instance, sometimes the term refers to the differential equations that the system satisfies and sometimes to the solutions to those equations. However, kinematics is simpler as it concerns only variables derived from the positions of objects and time. In circumstances of constant acceleration, these simpler equations of motion are usually referred to as the SUVAT equations, arising from the definitions of kinematic quantities displacement, initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and time. Equations of motion can therefore be grouped under these main classifiers of motion. In all cases, the main types of motion are translations, rotations, oscillations, or any combinations of these. A differential equation of motion, usually identified as some physical law and applying definitions of physical quantities is used to set up an equation for the problem. A particular solution can be obtained by setting the initial values, which fixes the values of the constants. To state this formally, in general an equation of motion m is a function of the position r of the object, its velocity, and its acceleration, and time t. Euclidean vectors in 3D are denoted throughout in bold. This is equivalent to saying an equation of motion in R is a second-order ordinary differential equation in R, where t is time, and each overdote denotes one time derivative. The initial conditions are given by the constant values at t equals zero, the solution R to the equation of motion, with specified initial values describes the system for all times t after t equals zero. Other dynamical variables like the momentum p of the object, or quantities derived from r and p like angular momentum, can be used in place of r as the quantity to solve for from some equation of motion. Although the position of the object at time t is by far the most sought-after quantity, Sometimes, the equation will be linear and is more likely to be exactly solvable. In general, the equation will be nonlinear and cannot be solved exactly so a variety of approximations must be used. The solutions to nonlinear equations may show chaotic behavior depending on how sensitive the system is to the initial conditions. History Historically, equations of motion first appeared in classical mechanics to describe the motion of massive objects. A notable application was to celestial mechanics to predict the motion of the planets as if they orbit like clockwork, and also investigate the stability of the solar system. It is important to observe that the huge body of work involving kinematics dynamics and the mathematical models of the universe developed in baby steps, faltering, getting up and correcting itself, over three millennia and included contributions of both known names and others who have since faded from the annals of history. In antiquity, notwithstanding the success of priests, astrologers and astronomers in predicting solar and lunar eclipses, 
the solstices and the equinoxes of the sun, and the period of the moon, there was nothing other than a set of algorithms to help them. Despite the great strides made in the development of geometry in the ancient Greece and surveys in Rome, we were to wait for another thousand years before the first equations of motion arrive. The exposure of Europe to the collected works by the Muslims of the Greeks, the Indians in the Islamic scholars, such as Euclid's Elements, the works of Archimedes, and Al-Khwarizmi's treatises began in Spain, and scholars from all over Europe went to Spain, read copied and translated the learning into Latin. The exposure of Europe to Indo-Arabic numerals and their ease in computations encouraged first the scholars to learn them and then the merchants and invigorated the spread of knowledge throughout Europe. By the 13th century the universities of Oxford and Paris had come up, and the scholars were now studying mathematics and philosophy with lesser worries about mundane chores of life. The fields were not as clearly demarcated as they are in the modern times. If these compendia and redactions, such as those of Johannes Campanus, of Euclid and Aristotle, confronted scholars with ideas about infinity and the ratio theory of elements as a means of expressing relations between various quantities involved with moving bodies. These studies led to a new body of knowledge that is now known as physics. Of these institutes Merton College sheltered a group of scholars devoted to natural science, mainly physics, astronomy and mathematics, of similar in stature to the intellectuals at the University of Paris. Thomas Bradwardine, one of those scholars, extended Aristotelian quantities such as distance and velocity and assigned intensity and extension to them. Bradwardine suggested an exponential law involving force, resistance, distance, velocity and time. Nicholas Orsma further extended Bradwardine's arguments. The Merton School proved that, that the quantity of motion of a body undergoing a uniformly accelerated motion is equal to the quantity of a uniform motion at the speed achieved halfway through the accelerated motion. For writers on kinematics before Galileo, since small time intervals could not be measured, the affinity between time and motion was obscure. They used time as a function of distance, and in free fall, greater velocity as a result of greater elevation. Only Domingo de Soto, a Spanish theologian, in his commentary on Aristotle's physics published in 1545, after defining uniform deform motion, the word velocity wasn't used as proportional to time, declared correctly that this kind of motion was identifiable with freely falling bodies and projectiles. Without his proving these propositions or suggesting a formula relating time, velocity and distance, De Soto's comments are shockingly correct regarding the definitions of acceleration in time, and the observation that during the violent motion of ascent acceleration would be negative. Discourses such as these spread throughout the Europe and definitely influenced Galileo and others, and helped in laying the foundation of kinematics. Galileo deduced the equation in his work geometrically, using Merton's rule, now known as a special case of one of the equations of kinematics. He couldn't use the now familiar mathematical reasoning. The relationships between speed, distance, time and acceleration was not known at the time. Galileo was the first to show that the path of a projectile is a parabola. Galileo had an understanding of centrifugal force and gave a correct definition of momentum. This emphasis of momentum as a fundamental quantity in dynamics is of prime importance. He measured momentum by the product of velocity and weight. Mass is a later concept, developed by Wiegens and Newton, in the swinging of a simple pendulum. Galileo says in Discourses that every momentum acquired in the descent along an arc is equal to that which causes the same moving body to ascend. Through the same arc, his analysis on projectiles indicates that Galileo had grasped the first law and the second law of motion. He did not generalize and make them applicable to bodies not subject to the Earth's gravitation. That step was Newton's contribution. The term, inertia, was used by Kepler who applied it to bodies at rest. 
The first law of motion is now often called the law of inertia. Galileo did not fully grasp the third law of motion, the law of the equality of action and reaction, though he corrected some errors of Aristotle. With Stevan and others, Galileo also wrote on statics. He formulated the principle of the parallelogram of forces, but he did not fully recognize its scope. Galileo also was interested by the laws of the pendulum. His first observations was when he was a young man. In 1583, while he was praying in the cathedral at Pisa, his attention was arrested by the motion of the great lamp lighted and left swinging, referencing his own pulse for timekeeping. To him the period appeared the same, even after the motion had greatly diminished, discovering the isochronism of the pendulum. More careful experiments carried out by him later, and described in his discourses, revealed the period of oscillation to be independent of the mass and material of the pendulum and as the square root of its length. Thus we arrive at René Descartes, Isaac Newton, Leibniz. Al and the evolved forms of the equations of motion that begin to be recognized as the modern ones. Later the equations of motion also appeared in electrodynamics when describing the motion of charged particles in electric and magnetic fields. The Lorentz force is the general equation which serves as the definition of what is meant by an electric field and magnetic field, with the advent of special relativity and general relativity. The theoretical modifications to spacetime meant the classical equations of motion were also modified to account for the finite speed of light and curvature of spacetime. In all these cases the differential equations were in terms of a function describing the particle's trajectory in terms of space and time coordinates, as influenced by forces or energy transformations. However, the equations of quantum mechanics can also be considered equations of motion, since they are differential equations of the wave function, which describes how a quantum state behaves analogously using the space and time coordinates of the particles. There are analogues of equations of motion in other areas of physics, for collections of physical phenomena that can be considered waves, fluids, or fields. Kinematic equations for one particle. Kinematic quantities from the instantaneous position R equals R. Instantaneous meaning at an instant value of time t. The instantaneous velocity V equals V and acceleration R equals We have the general coordinate independent definitions. Notice that velocity always points in the direction of motion. In other words for a curved path it is the tangent vector. Loosely speaking, first order derivatives are related to tangents of curves. Still for curved paths, the acceleration is directed towards the center of curvature of the path. Again, loosely speaking, second order derivatives are related to curvature. The rotational analogues are the angular vector theta equals theta, angular velocity omega equals omega, and angular acceleration alpha equals alpha, where n is a unit vector in the direction of the axis of rotation, and theta is the angle the object turns through about the axis. The following relation holds for a point-like particle orbiting about some axis with angular velocity omega, where r is the position vector of the particle and v the tangential velocity of the particle. For a rotating continuum rigid body, these relations hold for each point in the rigid body. Uniform acceleration The differential equation of motion for a particle of constant or uniform acceleration in a straight line is simple. The acceleration is constant, so the second derivative of the position of the object is constant. The results of this case are summarized below. Constant translational acceleration in a straight line These equations apply to a particle moving linearly in three dimensions in a straight line with constant acceleration. Since the position, velocity, and acceleration are collinear, only the magnitudes of these vectors are necessary. And because the motion is along a straight line, the problem effectively reduces from three dimensions to one, where R0 is the particle's initial position, R is the particle's final position, V0 is the particle's initial velocity, 
V is the particle's final velocity, A is the particle's acceleration, T is the time interval. Derivation equations 1 and 2 are from integrating the definitions of velocity and acceleration, subject to the initial conditions R equals R0 and V equals V0. In magnitudes, equation 3 involves the average velocity 2. Intuitively, the velocity increases linearly. So the average velocity multiplied by time is the distance traveled while increasing the velocity from v0 to v, as can be illustrated graphically by plotting velocity against time as a straight line graph. Algebraically, it follows from solving 1 for and substituting in 2, 2 then simplifying to get or in magnitudes from 3, substituting for t in 1 from 3, substituting in 2, 2. Usually only the first four are needed, the fifth is optional. Here A is constant acceleration, or in the case of bodies moving under the influence of gravity, the standard gravity G is used. Note that each of the equations contains four of the five variables. So in this situation it is sufficient to know three out of the five variables to calculate the remaining two. In elementary physics the same formulae are frequently written in different notation as where U has replaced V0, S replaces R, and S0 equals 0. They are often referred to as the SUVAT equations, where SUVAT is an acronym from the variables. S equals displacement, U equals initial velocity, V equals final velocity, R equals acceleration, T equals time. Constant linear acceleration in any direction The initial position, initial velocity, and acceleration vectors need not be collinear, and take an almost identical form. The only difference is that the square magnitudes of the velocities require the dot product. The derivations are essentially the same as in the collinear case. Although the Torricelli equation 4 can be derived using the distributive property of the dot products as follows. Applications Elementary and frequent examples in kinematics involve projectiles, for example a ball thrown upwards into the air. Given initial speed u, one can calculate how high the ball will travel before it begins to fall. The acceleration is local acceleration of gravity g. They could in fact be considered as unidirectional vectors. Choosing s to measure up from the ground, the acceleration must be in fact minus g. Since the force of gravity acts downwards and therefore also the acceleration on the ball due to it. At the highest point, the ball will be at rest. Therefore v equals zero. Using equation 4 in the set above, we have substituting and cancelling minus signs gives constant circular acceleration. The analogues of the above equations can be written for rotation. Again these axial vectors must all be parallel to the axis of rotation, so only the magnitudes of the vectors are necessary where alpha is the constant angular acceleration, omega is the angular velocity, omega zero is the initial angular velocity, theta is the angle turned through, theta zero is the initial angle, and t is the time taken to rotate from the initial state to the final state. General planar motion These are the kinematic equations for a particle traversing a path in a plane, described by position r equals r. They are simply the time derivatives of the position vector in plane polar coordinates using the definitions of physical quantities above for angular, velocity omega and angular acceleration alpha. The position, velocity and acceleration of the particle are respectively. Where are the polar unit vectors? For the velocity v, dr. dt is the component of velocity in the radial direction, and r omega is the additional component due to the rotation. For the acceleration a, is the centripetal acceleration and 2 omega drive, dt the Coriolis acceleration. In addition to the radial acceleration d2r, dt2 and angular acceleration r alpha, 
Special cases of motion described by these equations are summarized qualitatively in the table below. Two have already been discussed above, in the cases that either the radial components or the angular components are zero, and the non-zero component of motion describes uniform acceleration. General 3D motion in 3D space, the equations in spherical coordinates with corresponding unit vectors, the position, velocity, and acceleration generalize respectively to in the case of a constant this reduces to the planar equations above.